Hi everyone, this is Neil Wright, a consultant, audiologist and director of ClearWax. Thank you for joining me in my latest video using the iClearScope. And here we have a very interesting patient. They have uh, attended uh, many on many occasions previously and they most recently attended, I think earlier on this week. So this patient suffers from chronic otomycosis. So otomycosis is a term given to a fungal infection and they've had ear swab taken many times which always confirmed the presence of um, a fungus infection typically candida they've also had a concurrent bacterial infection in the past as well um, alongside their fungal infection so that that is also possible and so I referred this patient on to ENT not only because of this chronic otomycosis but also I suspect this patient may also have what we call a paraganglioma. Uh, another term given to a paraganglioma is a glomus tumour. And I'll, I'll describe that in more detail. So a glomus tumour is a benign, so non-cancerous vascular tumour. And it can be found anywhere around the body really where there's glomus cells present. So glomus cells are a type of nerve cell and they're found close to blood vessels and the nerves themselves. And when they're located in the middle ear, they're called glomus tympanicum. Um, now, you can also get a glomus tumour that develops um, around the jugular bulb, which is the upper dilated bulbous portion of the jugular vein, because this runs adjacent to the middle ear posteriorly. Um, and sometimes you can get, so if you have a glomus tumour, um, uh, which originates around the jugular bulb, we call that a jugular glomus. And if they grow quite big, they can present themselves in the middle ear. And the way glomus tumours are normally presented is that you see a reddish mass, a mass or a blushing of the eardrum. So if it's a glomus tympanicum, which originates within the middle ear, you normally find them in the what we call the anterior inferior quadrant. So in the case of this patient's right ear, around, say, four or five, sometimes even six o'clock. If they originate from the jugular bulb, they normally present themselves more posteriorly because if we were to enter through the eardrum and turn left um, and left again, that's where um, the, the mastoid bone is. Um, and it's in that part of the kind of the, uh, the ear where you would expect um, a jugular glomus to originate from. Um, Typical symptoms of a glomus tumour, sometimes patients don't have any symptoms and it's a completely incidental finding when we, when we examine the ear. But as I said, if you have a reddish mass behind the eardrum, um, now patients with glomus tumour can sometimes experience pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, and that's because the glomus tumour is highly vascular. So um, the function of um, the these glomus cells, at least in the middle ear and the mastoid region, is that they act as baroreceptors to help regulate um, O2 levels. Um, and they also secrete hormones like adrenaline. Um, so adrenaline is involved in the flight or fight response, uh, which increases, which results in higher blood um, pressure. And that's why they're highly vascular. Um, they can sometimes cause uh, what we call a conductive loss, where sounds can't efficiently travel through the middle ear to the inner ear, where the cochlear is, the organ of hearing. Um, and if they're really, really large, they can also cause vertigo because they can impact against the, uh, the vestibular organ. So the vestibular organ is connected to the organ of hearing. So in combination, we call it a labyrinth. Um, so it can also cause vertigo. It can impede against the facial nerve. So the facial nerve runs um, deep in the middle ear. So it can lead to facial palsy, so a drooping on one side of the face. Um, and if it's really, really large, it can actually uh, cause some damage to the organ of hearing itself. So it can lead to a sense, what we call a sensory neural hearing loss. That's where the organ of hearing itself will, and or the hearing nerve is affected. And in terms of treatment, sometimes it's just observation, just to monitor it, see if it grows. Uh, but sometimes uh, they need to be surg surgically removed or uh, th th sometimes they can also, you can use radiotherapy as well to, re to reduce the size of them. Um, so this... A patient I've referred to ENT for two reasons, because of that possible glomus tumour, but also because of this chronic otomycosis. So they are often uh, prescribed uh, antifungals from their doctor, but it just keeps coming back. Um, 
And so, so they saw ENT, uh, saw them back in the summer. They decided to go private just because the, the waiting list is quite long in the UK at the moment. And they were actually seen by an ENT that I know. Um, so, the, so this patient travels to see me, so they're not local. But I actually um, know the ENT because the ENT that they saw uh, was previously a registrar for, um, to an ENT consultant who I'm very good friends with. And I, I've bumped into them on a couple of occasions. And so that, that was a nice surprise. And they agree that there is a potential that this patient has a glomus tumour because of that red, redis mass so they've referred the patient for an MRI the patient has had the MRI so just waiting for the results now um, so fingers crossed everything's gonna be okay now I'll come back to why I'm using the correct um, now the reason why I'm using the correct obviously you can't um, can't use water so I know people can say why don't you use your water this patient's got an, an infection of the ear canal um, that's going to be uh, made worse by the introduction of water so whenever a patient attends with otitis externa, you should never, ever use water. Now, I don't use water anyway, but for anyone who does perform irrigation, um, they wouldn't be able to perform it in this in this case. Now, the reason why I didn't use microsuction is this, this patient does have tinnitus and it does generally spike post-procedure because the tinnitus can be a noisy procedure. And if you've already got quite troublesome tinnitus, we try and avoid it where possible. Now, sometimes it's just not possible. We, we have to resort to suction and we can minimise the exposure, reduce the noise by uh, reducing the suction power or using a smaller suction tip. But since I've um, got the new right angled correct, I'm, I'm able to really go deeper in the ear. And that's because now, our suction probes that we use to perform microsuction, there's a bend on them. And that bend um, enables uh, greater manipulation. It also prevents the, the hand holding the suction probe from coming in contact with the, the endoscope. So it improves your working space. Now, with traditional instrumentation, uh, like, like the correct, they're, not, they're usually straight instruments. And that can sometimes impede your maneuverability. Also, if you're using head loops or microscopes, sometimes the hand holding the instrument can come in front of your eye line. Particularly, so if, if, if you're right-handed, which, which I, so I'm gonna hold the instrument in the right hand, which I am, and the wax is on the right-hand side of the ear canal, um, because of the angle you have to insert the straight instrument, your holding hand can sometimes obstruct your line of vision so it really makes it difficult to remove particularly if the wax is really deep in the ear as well on the right hand side now that problem has somewhat become uh, has somewhat been uh, overcome by the angled instruments because your hand is typically away from your eye line um, and if you're using the endoscope it's away from the endoscope itself so it's not impacting against it so the benefits of the right correct now is that i can really really go deep with it which is a godsend, really. I've just got so much more maneuverability. Now, typically, you want to avoid wherever possible you <coughs> using uh, instrumentation like this in the inner two-thirds of the ear canal. Or, well, you can use them, of course, because I, I have in this case, but you just got to tread more carefully, and that's because you're more likely to come in contact with the bony part of the ear canal because, for example, in this case, we're having to scoot this discharge uh, off the canal wall. So I'm, I'm intentionally making contact with the ear canal here. Now, with the right correct, I've added a bit of curvature to the, the, the correct end, uh, which can mimic the curvature of the ear canal. So the reason for that is there's less friction um, and it can glide a lot better. So I was asking the patient um, throughout if they were comfortable and they were. Now, it's this outer part of the ear canal here where they found the ear to be extremely itchy and when I showed the video back, uh, they could see it themselves. And I kind of described that skin, um, almost like chicken skin. You'll see it. So if you, if you look carefully as it enters, especially on the right-hand side, the skin is quite, uh, I wouldn't say inflamed uh, per se, but, well, it, it is inflamed, but I'm just trying to think of another word. I'm going to struggle to think of another word. But yeah, the, the analogy I gave was that it's um, like chicken skin. So it's quite thick skin here. It's moist. Um, so all this discharge has macerated the skin, so it's kind of breaking away. However, um, the ear condition, believe it or not, is much better than previously, because in the past, all this discharge would be on the eardrum as well. In the past, I've managed to remove a lot with the uh, manual instruments, but I've had to res re resort to some suction 
as well um, because I couldn't really access it deep in the air and also because I'm working on the eardrum but so I know the ear look it is infected but it's a lot better than usual and this patient's done everything so um, they even bought uh, a humidity sensor to kind of see if there's anywhere in the house that's humid because warm moist humid conditions can aggravate the uh, fun- fungi so this fungi that's causing this infection infection candida we all have it in our ears it's part of a normal skin flora so the skin that lines the ear canal has its own resident bacteria and fungi but when the conditions of the ear change the fungi can overgrow and when it overgrows it stimulates an Im- immune response when you've got an Im- immune response uh, you get inflammation and you get obviously discharge as well because because of the overgrowth of the the fungus and now one of the things I kind of suggested and I've asked the patient to speak to ENT about it is is it possible that they've got a hyperactive immune response so they may have normal or near near normal levels I'll come back to that moment but that's that reddish mass bottom right so I've really zoomed in so it could be that they've got normal levels of um, candida in the ear but their body's reacting to it so the immune systems are hyperactive And then that's triggering an infection afterwards. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.